Hi, you join me inside the new, the all new, all singing, all dancing, may not sing or dance, Suzuki Jimny, the world's only lightweight, proper off-roader, so they say. If you like our off-road videos, and we are gonna test it properly and seriously off-road, why not like, subscribe, even turn on notifications so you will never miss a single thing. And so welcome to the inside of a car that replaces the previous Jimny, which had been around for more or less 20 years. So unsurprisingly, things have moved on a little bit inside. This is still a compact, lightweight, cheap car. So it still has a compact, lightweight, cheap interior, but it's actually quite funkily designed and there's a diddy little touch screen with Apple CarPlay and stuff like that. The rear seats go down, they're sort of plastic covered on the back and stuff. So there's enough space in there, I don't know, for a Spaniel or something. And that brings me to the kind of purpose of the Jimny. I mean, they call it a true off-roader because it is a true off-roader. It has a separate ladder frame chassis, just like off-roaders of yore, and it comes with two-wheel drive high ratio, four-wheel drive high ratio, and four-wheel drive low ratio. Because it has a naturally aspirated 1.5 litre engine, petrol engine, which is um, an unusual thing, I think we'll say. You know, peak power's at like 6,000 RPM, a peak torque's at like four which is pretty unusual for any car, let alone an off-roader. It gets low ratio gears. So I suspect it's the sort of car you have to rev. It's also an incredibly compact car, which is why it fits up narrow little ruts like this. And this is a car you see a lot of in the countryside. If you're gonna go shooting or if you're gonna go round farmland and stuff like that, having a car which has, is as compact as the Jimny, so you can fit between trees is actually quite a decent idea, I think. This one is in kinetic yellow, which is a new colour to the Jimny. I think it's green. Some of my colleagues think it's yellow. We're having a bit of a discussion about that. We'll decide I'm right, I think. Uh, and that's because they say, look, in, for use in quarries and things like that, it's nice to have a car which is brightly coloured. So if you're driving a large tipper truck, you will see the bright Jimny and not drive over the top of it. I mean, they're gonna put an orange light and reflective stripes in it anyway, aren't they? I think they've chosen kinetic yellow slash green because it looks quite cool. So for work environments or fun environments or countryside pursuit environments, how rugged is it? Well, it gets live axles front and rear and although they don't have locking differentials, it does have torque vectoring via braking effectively. So it will break a wheel that is spinning to divert torque to the other side. So, it, and, it, and also bear in mind, this car weighs about as much as a packet of crisps, so it's not quite so likely to get stuck and bogged down in mud. It also has, and you may notice I'm at the edge of a large brow here, very good approach, departure and brake over angles. From that point of view, being very short, having the wheels at the corners does make it an incredibly agile, easy to manoeuvre car on extreme grounds. There's just, there's just not too much chance of banging the body against things. If there is one area where its stats don't quite rival its larger off-road alternatives, it's the wade depth. So we're going to go for a wade and see, because how often do you really look at a puddle and go, well, is that 320 mil, which is this wade depth, or 550 mil, which is a serious big off-roader sort of wade depth? I think very often, really. What's more likely to be an issue and would make you buy a big rather than a small off-roader is a sort of towing limit. This car's got a 1,300 kilo towing limit because it only weighs 1,130 kilos itself, whereas the bigger stuff would be more adept at taking two horses in a box to a pony club dressage. <laughs> also, you can hear stuff sloshing around as if you've sort of left a, a can of half full water in a boot. You can just hear the water sloshing around that I don't think you would in, a, uh, in an off-roader that has slightly heavier body panels. But it just climbs places and goes places and skips over things like a mountain goat. Which brings me to perhaps the toughest challenge we will set this car today. Because we have a serious large off-roader and we're gonna go across a very severe rock crawl and then get back in this and see how well the Jimny copes with that kind of 
ultimate end of level baddie challenge. So the end of level baddie in this case is the new Toyota Land Cruiser three-door utility. It might not go quite as far off-road as some pure off-roaders, I'm thinking the Jeep Wrangler specifically, but there is an argument that it's the most capable off-roader in the world because of the breadth of its ability. The second thing about this car is that it is my company car. So I've done six and a half thousand miles now, I know it is very comfortable. It's also very capable, it's got separate body on chassis. It has a live rear axle, it's got independent front end. It should be quite good, but what I don't want to do, because I have to drive it home and then around for another few months, is damage it. So what we're going to do is, is drive this rock haul. I've got a Sherpa to guide me. It's got a low range gear box. It has a locking centre differential, which I will engage. Doesn't have locking front and rear diffs. You can get those in a Land Cruiser, but not the three door utility in the UK. Now, this one's a manual, but you can get an automatic, which would probably make crawling slightly easier and long distance cruising slightly easier too. It's got quite a long nose, weirdly, but otherwise it's got quite a short wheelbase. So the brake over angle and the departure angle are very good and ground clearance is high. It's a very rugged car. It can tow three and a half tons. This is, of course, about as lowly a spec as the Land Cruiser gets, really. And it costs in this spec about twice as much as the Jimny. We've been over this rock crawl range a few times in, in films that we've made. Some cars get over it very easily, very easily. Some cars get over it easily, others struggle. And this, it feels to me, is getting over this array. Actually pretty, pretty well. You've got to be a bit careful. You've got to sort of pick your path across it. But the Toyota fairly well, the Toyota fairly well eases across. So let's see how the Jimny will cope with its ultimate test of the day. What I can tell you, it's one of my favourite cars of the year already. Now the fact that it's a higher revving car means I will be probably working the clutch a bit more, a few more revs on, which is not necessarily ideal, but then you're not pulling two and a bit tonnes of off-roader with that. I'm only pulling 1,200 kilos with that, so there'll be less torque going through the clutch in total, which is, you know, it's not a bad thing. It makes 100 horsepower-ish, 95 foot-pounds. It feels like it's very softly sprung. The old Jimny, brilliant, very cool, wonderful thing as it was. It was quite a hard riding car on the road. Further left. Oh, that's where it starts to slip, but the torque vectoring by braking. So I've got a wheel off the ground, but the torque vectoring is just locking a wheel. Pushing torque to the other side. The Land Cruiser had a bit at this point where it was very, very close to the, uh, to the rocks. This is the hardest bit, certainly. Probably the easiest car I've driven over here is a Jeep Wrangler. Some cars that won't go over it at all. Of course, if you had a Land Cruiser on air suspension, you could raise it even further. But it takes a proper SUV to get over it. This is a proper 4x4, no question. To get the torque vectoring via braking to do its thing means one wheel has to spin a bit. And to get that means you have to put a bit of power on. Whereas if the differential was locked, you could basically do that at idle with very little slip from any of the wheels at all. So you would have a bit more low speed control than you actually get in the Jimny. Got a bit of clutch smell as well going on. But it is going, it is getting there. It is a car that is half the price, certainly not half of the capability. You see now I've got the slip again. And that's where this whole no looking diff thing creates its issues. The lowest point to the ground on the Jimny is actually not that dissimilar to the Land Cruiser, but whether the Toyota has more wheel articulation or general body height, for our humble Sherpa, it was easier to pick a route over the rocks in the Toyota than it was in the Jimny, which involved quite a lot of faffing. So you clearly got to be a bit more careful about your route. And also because it's got petrol, peak torque at four, it's rather more easy to stall. Will it go everywhere a Land Cruiser does? 
not with quite so much ease, but it kind of gets there or thereabouts. Right, deep breath, and then we'll sum up. So the Wee Suzuki Mountain Goat will not go quite as far, quite as easily as the biggest, baddest, best off-roaders, but it is half the price of them. It is certainly not half as much fun. In fact, off-roading in something like a Jimny, which reminds me of an original Jeep in a way, is about as much fun as you can get. If you've enjoyed it, don't forget to like, subscribe, and we'll see you next time in a deserted quarry. Thank you.